Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus number 41. The themes today are looking at 400,000 U.S. fatalities, vaccine timelines, and uh, staying safe in a pandemic for you. Uh, so unfortunately we crossed the threshold today of over 200,000 fatalities in the United States. Uh, likely this is actually an underestimate. Most experts would say we're under by about 30%, so probably more like 250, 260. Regardless, that's a lot of people. And one of the problems with that is it's getting to be such a big number, it's hard for most people to conceive of, which there's been some articles talking about that. Uh, sometimes it's good to visualize what over 200,000 people, and it's more than two uh, Husker stadiums full of people. That's a lot of people. It's like literally dropping a bomb on on, a Hus on the Husker game on a Saturday when it's fl completely full and then doing the same thing next week. That's how many fatalities so far. Uh, another way to think of it, it's more than uh, all the soldiers, uh, American soldiers that died in the Vietnam War, the, the, the Korean War, uh, the Iran-Iraq War, and 9-11 all put together. That, we've had more people die from that already. Uh, and most experts are predicting it's actually going to be over 400,000, which is more than four stadiums, and actually knocking on World War II level deaths in the United States, which is just a lot. And it's uh, unfortunate because most of it was avoidable. Uh, so the first 100,000 fatalities uh, kind of happened up in the Northeast. Uh, they were the first places hit. Then it moved to the South and California and Arizona. Mostly are getting theirs under control, though a mixed bag in Florida and Texas. Now it's spreading up the Mississippi Delta region and Wisconsin all the way to the Great Plains. So the, all this red, this is going to be the next 100 or maybe even 200,000 fatalities. Uh, and you can see all the states that are just all turning red, uh, including here in Nebraska. The reason we dropped 11 or 11 isn't because we got better. It's because so many actually got worse than us. Uh, which is unfortunate. And so if you look in uh, the problem with Nebraska is we've got two demographics getting affected. First is sort of the, the outstate Nebraska, outside of Lincoln and Omaha. That's the area where we're going to have a lot of fatalities because that's more community spread and more le leaking into nursing home spread where, where your mortality rate is going to get quite a bit higher. And so we've got this steady march of infections uh, throughout state Nebraska and the numbers just keep getting worse with no sign of stopping. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're seeing that spill, spill over. So if you look at the headlines in Lincoln that Brian Health had a surge in hospitalizations and actually more than half of ours are coming not from Lincoln and Lancaster County, they're coming from the surrounding areas and nursing homes that are getting affected. And so uh, those communities actually don't have the ICU capacity. So what happens, they ship them to Lincoln, Omaha, uh, Kearney, places like that. And that's what we're seeing. Here in Lincoln, it's a different demographic. Uh, we're a college town, so most of our spread, thankfully, is in the college population. I mean, it, there is some risk there. There's some risk of what's uh, called the uh, long hauler syndrome, which is a possibility. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more of that in, in a bit. We are getting some decrease. Hopefully, this continues, and hopefully, we can keep the, the college infections from spreading home. But, you know, those kids might come home to do laundry and eat dinner with mom and dad or hang out with a sibling. Uh, so hopefully, we can keep that out of our school system now. The general community only time will tell in the next week or two. So uh, my prediction, unfortunately, is I think a substantial part of Nebraska is going to go for herd immunity. Not all of us, but probably the rural third will go for the 30% range. And that means we're probably talking two to 3,000 Nebraska fatalities uh, over this year uh, coming up, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not sure why our state thinks that's a good idea. I don't know how a pro-life governor can be okay with that. But uh, it is what it is. But the good news is the rest of us don't have to go there. And I think what you'll see is that outstate Nebraska will go for herd immunity. And Lincoln and Omaha, uh, with their mask ordinances, will probably not and might wait for the vaccine, hopefully. So what about the vaccine? So there's a lot of controversy about the vaccine right now. Uh, and so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the math of, of how a vaccine gets studied and, and is OK to make sure that it's safe and effective and not going to cause more harm than good. And so most of the trials have been through five. There's multiple candidates that are through phase one and two trials. And what happens in phase one and two is you give it to the, the shot to some healthy adults and make sure they don't get sick. Uh, and if they don't get sick, OK, it's probably safe, but that's only a small group. You also measure the antibody response to see if it looks like it would actually induce the immune response that would protect you from infection. And so we're already at the point where we've given it to a few hundred folks. Uh, they didn't get sick and die. Uh, and they did generate antibody response. So the next stage is actually to try it out in real life. And that's where our, our vaccines are. So we already have a vaccine and multiple vaccines, not just in the United States, across the world. They're in the next phase, but that phase takes time. Uh, and so what you do in the next phase of vaccine trials, you start doing what's sort of called randomized controlled trials, where nobody knows who you have. You randomize half the people to get the vaccine, half to not get the vaccine. Nobody knows for sure who got it or not. It's held held blind. Only the study uh, people who evaluate actually know who in, who in the end got it or not. And you take a large number, not 150. You might put 10,000 in the patient vaccine and 10,000 in the patient placebo or larger. There are actually larger studies with 30 and 40,000. Uh, the thing is, you just need numbers to see if it actually works in real life. 
Uh, and like I say, it's already in Nebraska. We have three test sites. So the Meridian vaccine, uh, it's Grand Island, Norfolk, and Omaha. We're all picked as sites. So it's already been given to, to people in those communities. Now we're in the waiting phase of seeing does it work. Because you have to pick a community where the, vac where the virus is actually spreading to see if it works. And so it's a, basically it's a gamble to see if these nine communities were the right places. Uh, now we would see that Grand Island Hall County might actually not have been the right place. They had an outbreak when they, when it was picked as a site, but actually Hall County and Grand Island have done a good job of keeping their pandemic under control. So they're staying in the yellow, which is good, although from the vaccine trial perspective, it's actually not because they're not getting a lot of exposure to see if the vaccine works. Uh, Norfolk is a different story. So if you look at uh, Madison County, where Norfolk is, uh, is and, and you add all the counties around them, uh, you'll see that they have quite a bit more spread than Hull County and Grand Island. So this, it turns out, was one of the good places to study the vaccine. So it's probably getting put through its paces, and there are likely some positive cases in both vaccinated and unvaccinated, so we can actually see if it works. Uh, the Omaha arm of the trial is sort of in the middle, actually. So hopefully there's going to be enough to start getting that and see if the vaccine actually works. So hopefully the same is case, you know, South Dakota's numbers are far worse than us. There's a good chance that South Dakota also has a lot of cases to see if this works. So we're in the waiting phase to see if it actually worked. And here's kind of what it looks like. You know, you'd say, okay, the vet 10, let's say 5% of the vaccinated population uh, in this trial get infected. We'd see, okay, ideally what we'd see, for example, is the people in the placebo arm, 500 got infected, but in the vaccine, only 250. So that means it's 50% effective, which doesn't sound great, but I mean, it still is a, a difference. There was a, you know, 200 people who didn't get sick because of the vaccine, but there's 250 who still did. However, it's not just sick, but did they get hospitalized or fatalities? There are vaccines actually, which don't necessarily protect you from getting the infection, but they do decrease your chances of being hospitalized or dying that's the pneumonia vaccine that's given the elderly for example so let's say 10 got hospitalized who had the vaccine but 100 with the placebo did and then it's actually 90 percent effective for hospitalization or one dead versus 10 dead it's actually 90 percent so maybe 50 percent effective from preventing getting sick but 90 percent effective for being hospitalized and, and or dying to me that's a good vaccine and that's the kind of numbers we need to see uh, they'll collect those numbers whoever the study participants the the statisticians and principal investigators uh, they'll open their statistics programs, dump the data in, and they'll use Stata or SAS or SPS. This is Stata, for example, and this is exactly what it looked like. So the Public Health Committee wants to see this data to make sure it's safe, to know, sh know this is good. And this is the kind of data that people are saying. Before you do emergency youth authorization or anything like that or launch it in the general population, we need all this data. It needs to be independently verified. And then all of us in the healthcare community would say, yes, let's go ahead with this vaccine. This should not be rushed based on politics. So... And then, of course, so hopefully the trials will get bigger because we also want to know the difference between men and women, white, black, Hispanic, older versus younger. Uh, there are vaccines like that. So, for example, the flu shot is more effective in the younger population than the older. That isn't just that isn't necessarily a problem, though, because the way to protect grandma, it turns out, yes, it's good to in, get a flu shot for grandma, but it's even more important for the grandchildren to get the flu shot because that's how you would protect grandma is by vaccinating those around her. The same thing could be the case for coronavirus, actually. Most experts think we're about three to six months away. Uh, so the next thing we got to figure out though is our influence, our vaccination distribution, because right now we're working on getting everybody vaccinated for influenza because we, the last thing we need is two pandemics on top of each other. Uh, we've got a serious problem with our vaccination rates in Nebraska and that we have huge disparities in who gets vaccinated and who doesn't. In rural Nebraska, 30, 40% of people are getting flu shots versus 70% urban areas. And so this is a problem uh, as we need to figure out this. So hopefully this fall, we're going to, you'll hear a lot from the medical community really pushing everybody to get their, out in their flu shot. So please go get your flu shot because the last thing our hospitals need is, is two pandemics on top of one. So, uh, you know, and graphically what, what we don't want to avoid is, uh, you know, here's in the United States so far, uh, here's our fatalities uh, for coronavirus in our year. Here's a, you know, kind of a worse influenza year two years ago. You can see there's a big difference between these two. But the last thing you want is this on top of this. And here we, of course, here's New Jersey and New York, how they, uh, their infections went. They, as I so showed earlier, they've gotten things under control, so they're not seeing those fatalities anymore. Uh, if you move, if you look at Arizona and Texas, which were the you know the next two big hot spots, you know they this is their bad flu year two years ago versus now. The last thing they want is two. It looks like they're starting to get their uh, pandemic under control. And then here in Nebraska, we're starting to see the uh, early signs of us having more fatalities than you'd expect in say a bad flu year like you know a while back. So we're already starting to see some sign here in Nebraska based on the actual death certificates. So what should you do? Uh, so we're kind of stuck, and I, like I say, I think half, a, a third of the state's probably going to go for herd immunity regardless because there's no plan to stop it from a state level. Uh, so uh, probably two to 3,000 fatalities, but that doesn't mean you have to go there. 
So the big thing, of course, is wear a mask. And the C director came out and from his congressional testimony saying, hey, the mask is actually potentially more effective than the coronavirus vaccine. It's cheap. It's readily available. You already got it. So do that first, and then hopefully we'll get the vaccine later. So there's no reason to rush the vaccine because we already have a cheap and effective way to stop it. Uh, it's just that not everybody wants to do it, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, start your week. This is my mask sitting on the bathroom counter over the weekend. We wash all our masks and hopefully you've got a couple. I've got, you know, two that my daughter made, the Creighton mask, because I'm a Creighton grad that my mom gave me. Uh, these are some things. This is kind of how you should start your week to be safe. Um, of course, you have to wear it the right way. So my big frustration is the, you know, the nose commandos and nose flashers out there. You got to wear the mask correctly. So treat your mask like your underwear. Wash it regularly, especially if it's stained or dirty. Replace it when it's worn or holes. It needs to cover your parts just like your underwear. So wearing a mask like this is like wearing underwear with your butt crack showing and your fly open. So wear your mask appropriately. Um, and then layer these uh, interventions on top of each other. No public health intervention is perfect, and that's why we always layer them. And so I like this study that Dr. Fauci talked about. You've got X percent, X percent at layered on top of each other. And the way I look at this is what is your risk tolerance and what's your odds of being infected? Well, first set your baseline risk based on who you hang around. I have a social bubble that I'm pretty comfortable with. So first of all, I'm around people who are less likely to be infected in the first place. Then I can layer added things on based on my risk tolerance. And then so uh, I usually try to do two out of three of this, but not necessarily all three. So if I'm outside, I actually don't always wear a mask if I'm around low risk people and I've got some distance. And so look at these. If you add your low risk social bubble plus two of these intervention, you're over 99% effective. Uh, and then your risk tolerance is based on your own health condition. I'm uh, in my 50s, but I have no health condition, so my risk is probably pretty low. However, you might be obese or have high blood pressure, diabetes. Well, maybe you need three or all four of these just because you have a high risk, because if you get it, you might die, whereas I have a lower risk. So that's where you kind of set your own risk of tolerance, and these are things under your control for the most part, especially now that our schools require a mask, now that going to the grocery store requires a mask. That gives you safe places you can be in the community, and beyond that, you pick your social bubble hopefully. Hopefully. So uh, the biggest concern lately is what are called long haulers. There does appear to be that, you know, yes, most people don't die from coronavirus, but there's a significant number who seem to get uh, these post-inflammatory heart disease problems, uh, something that looks like chronic fatigue syndrome. There's a long podcast by my, uh, Dr. Mon Michael Osterholm that it's, I think if you're interested in that, uh, he'll give a better explanation than me anyway. So go to his 20, episode 24, Long Haulers, if you want to know more about this. Uh, again, pick your reliable sources. Uh, don't, uh, for the most part, uh, I'd be careful about anything in the news media and, and anything uttered by a politician, unfortunately. Uh, our governmental sources are just not reliable right now, so f look at the public health credentials of who, who's putting out this information, MD, MPH, what's their track record, do other people trust them, and quit uh, forwarding this stuff that's just way off base. Um, so the Wall Street Journal, I mean, an example of, of trust, mistrust in the CDC, I think what happened this week is actually someone from the CDC who knew what they were doing did put up the correct guidance on tiny air particles and aerosol spread, but I think a political foot person talk, pulled it down because they didn't want the information out. So unfortunately, I think we are getting some censorship of the CDC putting out good information of, by, by politicians. Uh, you know, why aerosol spread? Well, you know, this case I've used before, 27 people in a Starbucks, that's not all, it's hard to say that that's all droplet spread without at least some aerosol component. Uh, but again, you know, even with that aerosol component though, the employees wearing masks didn't get infected. So again, just wear your mask. In general, avoid this situation. So I was uh, meeting with someone at the, the mill coffee shop this morning. I put my mask in, got in my coffee, got back out and sat out in the patio. It's much safer on the patio. Just don't sit there inside, especially when the fall weather is beautiful like it is right now. Uh, and then, like I said, I keep saying, you know, get out there, support your local businesses. There are businesses that are trying to do the right thing. You know, Piedmont Bistro in my neighborhood, uh, Hub and Soul on Thursday was great. You had a band playing. Uh, people spread out are not being wearing masks. People in the dense portion are wearing masks. That's a good setup. So we have restaurants out there trying to, to keep their business going, provide a great space. You guys need to get out there, uh, have fun things. We did our, rodeo, uh, our rotary polio bike ride. This is our club president, Eric Drumheller, trying to do a sale. He wasn't too bad. Uh, we were at Christina's house. Nice bike ride, had a barbecue outside and a beer. Uh, this is all safe to do. So within a pandemic, we're not telling anybody to stay at home. You, There's lots of things you can do, even with uh, folks who are older. So my father-in-law and my and my father here, uh, we went to these winery tours. But again, as you can see, there's six feet of spread. They're low-risk people. Uh, and because of their behavior, plus we're outside, that's a safe place to be. So uh, in the end of the day, we, we don't have the silver bullet, bullet yet. That is the vaccine, but we do have silver buckshot. We have all these things we can do, layer those on top of each other, and you should be in a safe place to be. 
So as again, uh, if you're looking at all the past videos, uh, they're on, our, on the landing page of our well, uh, website, healthylincoln.org, on my nonprofit part of my day job. Uh, this is what I do for a living, but again, these are not necessarily the opinions of those folks, that, but, that, uh, but they, this is where I work to verify uh, that I do actually have a job and know what I'm talking about. Uh, and of course, you can uh, follow the YouTube channel if you want.